hear new things and be vulnerable and open to those things. So, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Our last speaker tonight is Tom D. Uh, with 24 years, and he's from Crossroads. Hello, I'm Tom, and I'm an alcoholic. And I totally have to go to the bathroom right now. <laughs> oh, okay today. Uh, I'm so grateful to be here. Um, I, um, I'm from Boston, Mass. My uh, home group is Boston Crossroads. We meet on Tuesday nights at the Church of the Covenant on the corner of Berkeley Street and Newberry Street, um, 8.30 to 9.30. We have two beginners meetings at 7 o'clock, so if you're ever in Boston, chilling around Newberry Street, come check us out. We're very diverse. Um, I, um, I grew up in Medford, Mass, uh, about five minutes north of the city with um, my mother, my brother, and my sister. And um, my dad left the picture when I was about two. Uh, my sister was three, my brother was four. And my mom worked um, three jobs to kind of pay the mortgage. My father was an active alcoholic, um, tried to kill my mom uh, when he was drunk. Uh, many times, just, he was crazy. So, um, when he left the picture, she didn't get any income from him, and I also never really saw him. Um, and, and that was uh, a theme that, that stayed with me for a majority of my life, that I didn't have that male role model growing up. I, I did have an older brother, but uh, later in life he moved out and wasn't really part of the picture um, for a good portion of my adolescence. Um, I started... Um, I was really, really quiet as a kid. I don't know if it's because of you know not having a dad you know and feeling really lost, but I was so afraid, you know. And I remember it of my youth. I, I remember it vividly. Just always being so afraid, afraid of people, afraid of social situations, um, of not fitting in. Um, uh, I would cry like the first day of school, like all the way up to like the sixth grade, because <laughs> I was so afraid. I was so afraid, you know, people and. Um, I'm not sure where it came from, but you know, I did, um, you know, I did have some fear um, when I was younger. My stepfather, my mother remarried, um, and and I met, you know, my stepfather um, when my mother was dating him, and I remember thinking he was um, a monster. You know, he smelled funny. His skin had like a green tint to it, and um, he had really bad teeth and scary hair, and he worked like the the third shift, and so I very, you know, I didn't see him very often. But when I saw him, I just remember being so afraid of him. And um, and he was also like the the disciplinarian. So whenever you know we would do something wrong, my mother would say, "Well, you know." Um, I'm going to tell John, you know, his stepfather, and I, we would all be so afraid because he would just, um, he would just spank us bare bottom as hard as he could, and I just remember always being afraid, you know. So it's just, it just added to that fear in my life of, you know, of doing anything wrong, and I had to do things right, and it was easy for me just not, you know, to kind of just not be seen. Um, and I know a lot of that, you know, plays, you know, plays uh, many roles throughout my whole life. I started drinking um, when I was 12, 13, um, and I loved it. I loved it, I loved it, I loved it. Because I stopped thinking, and I started acting, you know? And I wasn't shy when I was drunk, you know? And, and I didn't think about anything when I was drunk. I didn't really think. I was just crazy, you know? And, um, you know, and I love that feeling. It was like a feeling of being invincible. I could say what I want, you know, and, um, you know, I have a few, you know, different jackpots and stuff that had happened young, and um, I think about, uh, I think about them every once in a while. I, um, I got sober at 17. Um, May 6, 1988 is my sobriety date, and I've been blessed not to pick up since. So um, I, I celebrated this past May 24 years of sobriety. And sometimes it's sometimes it baffles me like it's crazy because I don't really think about time so much. When I first got sober, that's all I could think about. Oh, how much time do you got? Oh, I don't know. How much time do you got? You know, going back and forth about time. You know, um, I was uh, jumping ahead. 
I mean, okay. <laughs> I, uh, I started drinking with my sister and her friends in high school. She had just transferred into the high school that I was in. She was in like a private school and I was in like the regular school. And my brother was already removed from the house at that point. Um, he invited a whole bunch of people to the house. They smoked a lot of pot, drank a lot, and they did about $3,000 worth of damage to my mother's house. And he was put into like a residential home. So he was removed from the house like almost immediately. And then my mother sued the parents of all those kids. And it was just my mother, my sister, and me, the youngest boy. So I got picked on the rest of the time because my brother wasn't around for the actions that him and his friends had caused. And it was, uh, it was kind of a little bit of a nightmare. So maybe that adds to why you know, I didn't want to be seen. Um, but when I, you know, the, the drinking for me was, um, you know, we would drink under the bridge and, and I never drank because I loved the taste of it. It was disgusting, you know, and, um, but I loved to get hammered. So I wanted to drink as fast as I could. And, um, at some point in time, the drinking turned into, um, like cries for help. So when I was really, really drunk, I would like reach out for cries for help. I don't know, maybe it was the people I was hanging around. There was, had a lot of suicidal ideations. Um, we, one of my friends did kill himself. He hung himself and his sister found him. Um, but prior to that, um, you know, I just, I remember like, I had so much pain inside and I, I had friends, but the, I would never really share anything deep with these people. You know, like they were friends, but you know, you, you can't know everything about me. <laughs> and um, I remember I was so, I needed so much attention, you know, like I just needed attention when I was drunk and nobody was paying attention to me. So I, I told my friends, I had the story made up in my head that I was going to jump off the back porch, the second story, but I was going to like be this like big drama queen when I went to jump. And so I went into um, the living room, of course this was a party at my mother's house, <laughs> while she wasn't there. And uh, I said, that's it, I'm going to jump. And I ran out to the kitchen and I'm waiting and nobody came. <laughs> and finally when someone came around I jumped to the other side and I didn't even think of it and I just jumped. And I landed and my knees hit my chest and I, and I pretended to be unconscious and listened to what they were saying as they were screaming, oh my god, oh my god. You know, and um, it's kind of funny now, but it wasn't funny then. You know, I was thinking about it, and I'm like, God, I was just so, I needed so much attention because I just felt so unloved, unlovable, unloved, unworthy. Um, nobody loves me. Um, that ended me up in, uh, by the end of that tragedy, I um, cut my arm. Um, I went to an emergency room. I got pink slipped into a, 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 a nut house um, north of Boston um, called Ballpate Hospital. And I was like, oh no, no, <laughs> I was 15 and I'm like, oh no, I don't belong here. Like the bathrooms had like no, no um, locks on the doors, so like the door would go ee! like open up. And so like, but the toilet was like on the other side. I'm like, oh no, I can't be here. I'm like, I gotta go. Like all this fear, you know, so much fear of being there. And people saying that they could hear voices in their head and I'm like, oh my God. You know, and so I promised, and I promised, you know, oh, I'll never drink again, I'll never drink again. Um, it's just a recurring, you know, I got out of there, my insurance dropped me, I was out in two days, and a week later I was doing the same thing again. I was, um, I was 17, I was in foster care after that incident. Um, I love my mother. She did the best that she could do with us kids. And, and I was in foster care not because of my mother, but because of my own actions. And it took many years to figure that out. Um, it wasn't because she didn't love me. She loved me enough to help the courts to intervene to save my life. And then my actions had me pulled from, my, from her house, not because of anything that she did. But I was in foster care. I was 17. I was working at a department store. and. Uh, you know, I was still going to Medford High School and taking buses and I just, I was so lost and hopeless. I was just so ugly, you know, just so ugly. And uh, we were going to family therapy and treatment and I'm an Alateen kid, so I grew up in Alateen, so I understood the whole concept, um, you know, of alcoholism and stuff. It's just like, well, that's not me, you know, that's not me. But I spent so much time in therapy, you know, individual therapy or therapy with my family, you know, because of my brother's stuff. Um, you know, we kept going, and I, it was, it was uh, May, May 5th, I went to a, a meeting with my sister and my mother, and, and uh, my sister told me that she, that my mother was going to bring up the fact that I was doing coke, 
and I was like, oh, like, I'm such a mama's boy. You know, I would always cry when my mother cried. My mother very rarely cried, but when she cried, I just, I would just break down. And, um, and I remember being so rageful at her. You know, like, you know, who is she to butt into my business? You don't love me. I was so hurtful. You know, like, get on the wrong side. You know, and I just lashed out. And, um, you know, and she took it. And she cried. And I didn't cry. I was stone-faced. You know, like that, you know, uh, the privilege of drinking and doing drugs, I guess. Yeah. And the next day she... Um, she wanted. She told me that night, I'm going to take you um, somewhere for um, a birthday present, but it's really expensive. And so my birthday is in August, and it was May 6th. And I'm thinking, I wonder what it could be. <laughs> well, maybe a new car or a leather jacket. I grew up with without money. Like there was no money, you know. So I was so self-centered, you know, about stuff. And um, she took me uh, to this. Uh, place. It was called Straight Incorporated. It was uh, 45 minutes from where we live and it was a 13 month long term drug treatment center. And it was honestly the best gift, the best gift that she could have ever given me. I was so afraid there. Um, I had so much fear and um, You know, I was in this treatment center with 200 other adolescents, 13 to 21, 22, and um, I went through the steps, the traditions. Um, I was there from 8 in the morning till 10, 11, 12 at night. Sometimes it was crazy, you know, but they just stripped me down to nothing and, and tried to put the pieces back together, you know, and helped me guide me through it. It was controversial, that place. Um, there's actually a movie on it. Uh, they had one down in, in New York. It was uh, called Over the GW. And um, I was in, in one in Stoughton, Massachusetts. And uh, it worked for me. You know, I met some amazing people in treatment. You know, um, the difference between treatment and the real world is in treatment you feel that you can share everything. <laughs> and when you get out to the real world after being sober for a while, you have to find the right people to share things with. And, um, you know, I was lucky. I, you know, I was five years sober. Um, I, I had amazing friends. I was a secretary of uh, Savin Hill in South Boston. I was going to meetings. I had a sponsor. You know, all this stuff. And I woke up one morning five years sober, and I was just, I looked in the mirror, and I was just so disgusted with what was looking back at me. You know, I'm like, I'm doing all these things. You know, but I don't feel good about myself. You know, it was, um, you know, rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. I never really did a true fourth step. I never really completely opened up. You know, I had too much fear. I had to look good. I had to say the right things. And um, I would always get an anxious, like, when I had to speak or, like, any speaker discussion meetings, like, when you had to speak and say something, because I felt all those same things. I'm not good enough. You know, the, all that disease stuff. I'm not good enough. You know, what I have to say isn't good enough. Or I try to be bigger or better than I was. And, um, and then I come out of the closet. You know, and um, I let people in. I found, um, you know, I, I go through cycles in my recovery. I do a lot, and then I start to slip. And then I do a lot, and I start to slip. And I don't want to drink. I don't want to drink. You know, um, I have a sponsor. Um, when I was 13 years sober, I lost my best friend in AA. He was 13 years sober also. I found him... Um, on the night of a, a cabaret show for the Boston Gay and Lesbian Roundup that I had joined. I started doing service at that point. Um, and he um, died in his sleep. And I found him with a 19-year-old co-worker. And I, um, I'm usually like behind the scenes. I like to have a good time. I don't like a lot of drama. Um, you know, and this kid, I love him. You know, I just love him. He's the first person I shared everything with. There's not one thing about my, about me, not one thing, past or present, that somebody doesn't know. Not one thing. Everything is out there. And it took a lot of work for me to get there. You know, but it took a lot of trust. 
you know, and um, working the steps and having a sponsor and getting, you know, getting past all that crap. And, um, you know, I, there's a lot of talk about the wreckage of the past, you know, but no one really talks about the wreckage of the present. You know, all that crazy stuff I was doing. I got sober at 17. I've got a lot of crazy things. I'm 40. Two, one, two, forty-two. You know, and I've done some crazy, crazy things. You know, and um, I started to go. You know, um, I joined uh, Crossroads when I was five years sober, and I met some, some just some great men. You know, in my life, and I never felt worthy. You know, I never felt worthy. I never felt like I measured up as a man. You know, and and then this group um, and the group of guys that from my group. You know, when we go out speaking and stuff, the best part of going on a commitment is the car ride to and the car ride home, or well, the train ride to, train home, however you do it. You know, it, it, it for me it makes that connection with other people. That um, being sober isn't always about. Um, to go into meetings and, and having to always be so serious. You know, I have beautiful things in my life today. You know, I laugh a lot. I'm, I'm borderline inappropriate, but you know, it's all right, I'm not drinking today. <laughs> I have a great job. I've been with uh, CVS Pharmacy for 22 years. Uh, I did a, a stint with them in Fort Lauderdale. I went to California with them as a, uh, um, uh, doing training for some acquisitions. Um, I started a photography business about a year and a half ago. And and I've seen a lot of things come out of that. I feel really good about myself. But when I started, it was the same old tapes. You're not good enough. You're not good as this one. You're not as good as that one. And this is with 20-something years of sobriety. It's the same stuff. And I always have to keep working on myself. You know, the message is, it's funny. I know that the time is, the time is important to show that there's hope. But to me, the time doesn't mean anything. I don't want to be around with somebody else who has the same length of sobriety because they have a length of sobriety. I want to be around somebody that has quality sobriety, that's working the steps, that's not going to help guide me down, you know, the wrong path. You know, and... Um, and I don't do 12-step work alone because I know myself too well. It's easy for me, you know, to get sidetracked sometimes. I, um, I met, um, you know, I met a man in this program, you know, uh, my husband. I've been with him for 17 years. We got married last year. Um, 150 people came to our wedding, and it was so beautiful. I love my, I love my husband. You know, if you know me, I talk about him. You know, I just love him. You know, 17 years, and he's not an alcoholic. He's a normal person. You know, so uh, it works out great. You know, I kind of like the normal ones. <laughs> Those are the issues, I guess. I don't know. I um, I just if there's a message that I can give tonight is no matter what happens today you don't have to drink you know and as long as you're the best you that you can be and you find the right people eventually you'll be able to get that garbage out you know and um, if nobody told you they love you today I do